Hello. So today we're going to talk about surgery for canine Chiari malformation and syringomyelia. So what problems does this disease cause? What problems are we trying to address? Well, the most important one and the most common reason for surgery is that the dog is in pain. The next would be phantom scratching. So if you're not too sure what I mean by that, I don't mean scratching at the back of their head um, or scratching at their ears. I mean an evoked scratch, scratch, which means that when you rub a certain area of the dog's skin, usually the neck, the shoulder or the chest, you're able to stimulate a scratching action, usually just with one leg only. And this scratching action is also seen spontaneously and when they are walking, especially on the leash, because the leash and collar rubs on that specific area and it's it's quite disabling. Having poor emotional health and sleep disturbance, this really relates to pain, but it's a major cause in, uh, in lack of quality of life. Having weakness because of damage to the spinal cord uh, uh, and affecting the muscles going to the limbs, the spine, and possibly even swallowing if the syrinx goes up high enough. And cervical torticollis or scoliosis, which is twisted spine. Now, if you want to know more about these clinical signs or this is not clear to you, then I would suggest that you check out my YouTube on the clinical signs of this disease. And this shows Molly here uh, before and after pain relief. So this wasn't with surgery. This was just with drugs. And you can see here that Polly had a very anxious, a worried face. And then after pain relief, she's a lot more uh, relaxed. So when would I consider surgery to be indicated and that is quite a personal question because there are neurologists who would favor doing surgery every single time they usually tend to be people who tend who are very keen on doing surgery rather than medical management but when would i uh, suggest that surgery is indicated well for me it's where they have uh, chiari malformation pain uh, or pain related to the stringomania it's sometimes difficult to tell the difference between those two but for me, um, having pain associated with the Chiari malformation is still very important. So the dog doesn't necessarily have to have a syrinx. And where that is unresolved with medical management, I do feel that if the, you're able to give the dog a good quality of life on drugs, then that is a good option for the dog. Uh, the other is when I can see that on the MRI that the signs are likely to be progressive or where we have a history where the signs have been progressive. Uh, and where we know that there is a very severe stringomyelia or hydrocephalus where the prognosis for the dog is not uh, for medical management is not good at all. Now, what are those signs? Well, this uh, example of an MRI scan is between a dog that was eight months old and three years old. And you could tell in this dog, especially, I suppose, using hindsight, that the dog had many signs that suggested that the syrinx was going to be progressive. The first is that we can see that the uh, sulci, the spaces between the brain, the channels between the brain containing CSF, are completely effaced in, this, um, in the front of this dog's brain here. You see, you can't see any of those lines. Three years le later, you can see those lines because um, the dog has, uh, has reached a, an end state and actually the uh, pressure in the head is likely to have decreased. We can also see in this dog lots of evidence of high velocity flow. And this is often referred to as an artifact. And some people think, oh, look at all that artifact in the syrinx. But actually, this artifact tells you that there is this fluid in here is likely to be at high velocity. Why is it black like that? Well, it's because the fluid has already moved on by the time the MRI scanner has coil has acquired the image. Uh, and so it is uh, shows as a void. Um, and this shows that this fluid is very high velocity in this syrinx and therefore likely by the slosh effect to be expanding this syrinx. So we can see here we just have a little bit of a pre-syrinx going on, a little bit of edema in the spinal cord. And by three years of age, we've got a very wide, what we call hollow cord uh, syringomyelia going right down to almost the conus. And uh, actually, there is very little fluid void. Uh, in this dog. So in this dog, if we saw it at eight months old, we would say that because of these particular signs, the high uh, velocity flow and the loss of sulci detail, this dog is likely to progress 
you're probably saying, why didn't this dog have surgery? Well, the owner decided not to have surgery and actually the dog was clinically much better despite having the syrinx. So, uh, and this is probably because uh, this was when it, the brain was at a high uh, pressure and now everything's kind of stabilized. So again, it's, um, it's not always a, a, a done thing that they need to have surgery. And I need to bust a few myths basically because there's a lot out there where people are making assumptions and it's not necessarily the case. The first myth is that syrinxes actually have a rapid expansion over a short period of time, and then they remain remarkably stable. They reach a sort of hydrodynamic equilibrium. I say that tentatively because I am not a fluid mechanics, and I do work with fluid mechanics, and they tell me that's not the correct words to use, but it is something that I kind of understand, that they get to a state of equilibrium where the brain and the spinal cord, which, which was having a problem with compliance and high pressure because of the syrinx formation, gets to a period of, of, of low pressure. And so it, it, it becomes very stable. So actually, when you are a vet uh, doing an MRI scan of the dog, you're probably seeing it at its peak of clinical signs in many cases. And so the syrinx has reached that sort of maximum size and changes only over only over millimetres. It's really when you're scanning breeding dogs that you can see that syrinxes may uh, progressively change because those dogs are supposed to be scanned when they don't have clinical signs. So syrinxes do, don't, do not have this kind of linear growth. You know, at one year of age, it's going to be this big. And then at five years of age, it's going to be this big. And by 10 years of age, it's going to be massive and you'll have to put the dog to sleep. No, um, it, they often when they, they have the biggest syrinx they're going to get by about three years of age. However, I don't have the data that I can show you to prove that because naturally most people don't um, have their dog MRI scanned every year. And that would be completely excessive for clinical reasons, even if they wanted to do, um, to do that in most instances. Obviously, there are some dogs where that would be an exception um, and they would want to monitor it. So the next myth is that truly successful syringomyelia surgery re will reverse the filling mechanism and the syrinx will collapse. You will not see a syrinx. That is what successful surgery looks like. And when um, uh, human surgeons talk about doing a foramen magnum decompression with an 80% success rate or a 90% success rate, that is what they mean, that the syrinx has collapsed and gone away. If you're reading a surgical paper, and it says that there was a stabilization of the syrinx or that it had a very small reduction in size, should we say a millimeter, then that is not uh, a surgical success. Basically, if the syrinx is expanded in the spinal cord, it is still filling up. It can't expand that spinal cord if it's not actively filling, filling with fluid. It's not just a static pool of fluid there, a little stagnant bag of fluid. It is actively filling and emptying all the time. There is fluid moving through the spinal cord, filling up that syrinx. So if the spinal cord is expanded, then the syrinx is filling. Many animals will uh, improve in clinical signs of pain despite there being a big syrinx there. And that's likely to, to be an improvement of the Chiari pain. And it may be that some of the surgeries will improve that pain associated with having the overcrowding of their brain within a, a too small skull. Um, and the surgery will correct that. And if that is helping the dog, brilliant. Uh, but not necessarily reversing the syringomyelia or the signs associated with the syringomyelia. And also it should be said, like our three-year-old dog um, that we looked at before, uh, if we just go back to that dog there, this dog, as far as the owner was concerned, was clinically better. So if I had done surgery here and I hadn't done an MRI scan, didn't do surgery, if I had done surgery, then the owner might be telling me at three years old, their dog was doing great, thanks very much, um, doing much better. So uh, again, you may argue, well, what's, what's the difference? But what I'm saying is that you cannot read a surgical paper and make an assumption that the surgery worked just because the dog is clinically better if there isn't um, uh, uh, any other proof. Um, so um, I would argue that if you're doing these surgeries, then you need to do post-operative MRI. I've been very fortunate and worked in places that supported me doing very low cost or even free post-operative MRI scans 
um, to, uh, because they felt that it was very important that we have uh, an outcome uh, that we could uh, show. Um, but that's not all veterinary practices. The other myth is that adhesions are caused by blood products. And uh, I would uh, challenge to say that most people do not have a bloodless surgery. And if they do have a bloodless surgery, then maybe something's wrong with their anaesthetic. And if you put a, um, a, 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 um, an implant in and there's blood products below the mesh or the, whatever the implant is, then there will still be adhesions. So putting an implant in doesn't stop adhesions. So what sort of surgeries can you have? Well, this is a cartoon. It's very simply meant to represent the brain with ventricles, subarachnoid space, which is hugely big in this cartoon, with a spinal cord. And then we have a tethered, uh, tether of the spinal cord, which is the normal phylum. Um, so what sort of surgeries can we do theoretically? Not necessarily always do. The first is that we can drain the ventricles to an alternative receptacle which is often the peritoneal space, but doesn't have to be. It could be the pleural space or some other potential space. So we put a shunt in. Um, the shunt usually has a one-way valve and another tube that connects to that, um, uh, to that space. The next option is that we can widen the, um, widen the skull at the back. So we can widen that craniospinal junction, which is referred to as usually a frame of magnum decompression, and make more space for the overcrowded brain tissue. The next option is that if there are adhesions, then we can remove them. Where might this be an, uh, a, a situation? Well, first of all, those uh, adhesions may have occurred post-trauma. So post-traumatic syringomyelia is usually when you have a very severe spinal cord injury. In, in humans, um, they would often be wheelchair bound after such an injury. And then you have adhesions usually going all the way around the, the spinal cord. So the cerebral spinal fluid can't go backwards and forwards. And if you remove those uh, adhesions, then uh, there's a chance that the syrinx may reverse. Imagine if you are paraplegic or a wheelchair user and you have a developing syringomyelia at the level of your injury, that syrinx can go up and down and make your existing injury much worse. So if you're a wheelchair user but had, had full use of your of your arms and the syrinx that is developing going up your cord is taking away the use of your arms, then this is an extremely dev devastating consequence of your severe injury. So you want to do everything you can to prevent that. The problem is that when you go in and do that surgery, then you cause more blood, uh, more sort of trauma, and then the adhesions can, can reform. So it is it is a, um, a surgery which sounds like a, a great idea and as commonly done because there's not many other options, but often has a recurrence rate. Where is it applicable in veterinary medicine? Well, with those pugs with uh, compressive myelopathy, they, um, uh, which has a, a multifactorial pathogenesis, but part of it often is adhesions around the spinal cord and theoretically removing those adhesions may improve the CSF flow and reverse the small syrinx that you often see in those, in those dogs. Our next option is to take place a drain into the syrinx itself and put that to an alternative receptacle. So a pleural space, peritoneal space or the subarachnoid space. So we can put a drain in here and, and drain the fluid out. The next option is you can cut the tethered spinal cord. Now, this only applies if the spinal cord is tethered. Um, and that means um, uh, pu pu something which is uh, pulling the spinal cord down affecting the compliance and movement of that spinal cord and promoting a syrinx. So the most common cause of this would be a, a lesion that is related to a neural tube defect like, to, like spina bifida, where you have um, a tight cord or where you have a fat pad in there or where you have another um, something, something like myelokathesis, which is pulling on the spinal cord and uh, uh, and changing that spinal cord compliance. It's actually quite a rare uh, surgery for syringomyelia. Some people are proposing it for Chiari malformation and syringomyelia, but I think the jury is very much out uh, for that. So when do we do these different um, surgeries? Well, for me, if the animal has ventricular dilatation, then so big ventricles, then, um, and this duct, dog here actually has hydrocephalus, um, so more than just big ventricles, has a, 
a full-blown forebrain and um, cerebellar problem related to obstruction through the lateral apertures. If the dog has big ventricles, then placing an intraventricular shunt may be the best option. So this is the big ventricles. This is the um, high velocity fluid going through here because it's obstructed through the lateral apertures. And then here we have a massive syrinx, which is developing the dog. We can see the pre-syrinx coming down here. There is the shunt put in. And this is about a month post-operative. And we can see that the syrinx has completely collapsed. And I think this is quite amazing. And it shows you what it should look like if the surgery is successful. I mean, the spinal cord should look really almost normal, except it's not normal. Um, I'm sure if we did a, a post-mortem study on this dog and looked inside there, we'd find some damage to that spinal cord. But that's what would be regarded as a good surgical outcome. So for those who might not be very familiar what I'm talking about the shunt, um, this is uh, another dog with hydrocephalus. You can see the open fontanelle here and, and also here. Um, and here is the shunt going in, uh, into the ventricle. And uh, this was a little hole, additional hole we did to, to help secure that shunt. Um, and, uh, and then you can see the valve here um, and the fluid is draining this way. Um, it's quite a lot of tube here. I realize in the post-operative CT, but this was a puppy. So um, it's giving it a lot of room to grow. Um, and that goes into the peritoneal cavity and the fluid is sort of flowing this way. I'm not going to go into how you select the shunts and the opening pressures of the valve, etc. Um, it's really a lecture in yourself. But I would say that if you do want information on that, then there's many books and other papers that will address it. This just happens to be the one where I wrote uh, a chapter. Um, so I know that that information is is in there. And obviously this is uh, uh, quite a nice book if you're uh, spending a lot of time uh, looking after dogs that have brachycephaly and uh, flat face um, problems. So the, why don't we do shunts all the time? Well, they're expensive. Buying a, a shunt, even a very, very basic shunt, um, is, is quite expensive. And they are prone to having uh, complications, in particular subdural hemorrhage. Um, my one tip I will say is that you, you, you real, these dogs are not at high pressure. Chiari malformation dogs do not have high uh, raised, uh, very high raised intracranial pressure in their heads. You do not want to have a, a, a valve with um, a low opening pressure or even a medium opening pressure in, in, um, in my experience. So they're very, very predisposed to subdural hemorrhage. What does that look like? Well, this is one dog that had surgery. So we can see this is actually a T1 weighted image here. We can see his uh, ventricles here, quite big, um, quite big uh, fourth ventricle here, uh, herniation of the cerebellum here, syrinx here. The dog was deteriorating, very big ventricles, as you can see. So um, he put a shunt in. And this is actually, um, uh, he had the surgery at one year of age. And this is the appearance of his brain seven years later, seven years later. He had a bleed uh, almost a month after surgery. And this is what a subdural hemorrhage looks like after it's been sitting in the head for seven years. They, they get minimally absorbed. Um, and they become progressively calcified. Uh, and you can see how squashed his little brain is. The shunt is um, debatable whether that shunt's functioning. I severely doubt it. The interesting thing, though, is you probably notice the dog doesn't have syringomyelia. Um, it does still have quite big ventricles, um, doesn't have syringomyelia. And um, how well, there obviously is still a herniation, perhaps not as much as before because the dog doesn't have uh, as much uh, uh, doesn't have quite as big ventricles. So actually the dog's clinical outcome was uh, quite good. Um, but the dog at, was extremely sick following this massive bilateral subdural bleed. Um, and the owner certainly went for an extremely traumatic time. Um, and um, and uh, it, uh, I wouldn't really want to repeat that experience. Uh, although the outcome, you could argue, was uh, was OK for the dog and he lived out his life uh, dying eventually because he was a cavalier of mitral valve disease. 
The other option is to place a, um, a shunt into the syrinx itself. And this was one that was written up uh, by my colleague Anna uh, Toro, who was um, a resident that worked with me. Um, she loved this little pug um, and, um, uh, and uh, really campaigned for him to have surgery. And he had a, a problem that meant that he had some adhesions between C2 and C3. Um, and this was a, an arachnoid diverticulum. And then he had a syrinx that was behind that arachnoid diverticulum. And we did surgery together and removed the arachnoid adhesions. But as I said before, arachnoid adhesions can often reform and the syrinx uh, got progressively worse. And so and he was having a lot of signs associated with that. And so uh, we popped in this little drain here. And this is the post-operative scans. And you can see that the syrinx uh, then and obviously cleared up the new adhesions again. And uh, this syrinx went down into the pleura. A lot of people ask me, why did you put it into the pleura? I think because as neurosurgeons, we're often a little bit scared about going into the chest. Uh, well, there's no correct um, uh, uh, place to put the, uh, the shunt. Uh, it has to be into a cavity where there is an epithelial lining that can absorb the fluid and the pleura was the closest place and the shunt wasn't that long um, uh, it wouldn't have stretched all the way to the peritoneal cavity so that was the reasons for being the pleura same is often true of, of humans will often have a shunt placed into the pleural cavity just because of a uh, location uh, it makes it a much easier approach so um, I, I, I confess I was, I was really quite scared doing the surgery. It wasn't very nice um, cutting into the spinal cord at um, the level of C2 and putting a shunt into it. Um, I was, um, it was really the, the support and encouragement of my resident really wanting to do this for this dog that, that we did it. And of course, the owner being quite keen. You can see the shunt going in here. You can see the many stay sutures that um, were put there. That's what it looked like before. Um, uh, and um, we didn't have any complications except one. Um, the the uh, shunt came out. The uh, We did, did a routine radiograph and then saw, saw that the shunt was no longer in the pleural space. Dog wasn't doing quite so well, I think, maybe as well. Um, and we needed to reinsert it. But interestingly, when we found the end of that tube, it was still dri dripping CSF. So we did know it was actually working. So it was fiddly, a bit scary, didn't have any major problems. The dog did much better, was was um, was was walking again afterwards. But we only, I've only done one of those. Um, and so I can't really draw any conclusions because uh, the next three could could go much more poorly. The most common surgery that we do is a cranial cervical decompression, which is also called a frame and magnum decompression. And uh, in this, there are many variations, but... I think that the most important thing is that you remove as much of the supraoccipital bone as you can. There are some blood vessels that are here um, and there is definitely a big, um, uh, a big sinus here. So if you encroach on that, you're going to have problems. And then you remove as much of C1 as you can as well. I don't I go right the way back to the ligament. I then think it's very important to open up the, the um, membrane that's here. It's often very tough tissue and that's part of the compression. And I make a cruciate incision, as you can see here, and I tack back the meninges because I feel that's very thickened and it contributes to some of the compression. And then I cover it with a bioresorbable material. Um, uh, uh, if we can still get it, I think there's some supply problems again. It's an extracellular matrix derived from uh, porcine small intestine. Other people prefer to cover with uh, some kind of implant. I was going to say, if you cover with an implant, don't make it flush with the, uh, as the bone. It's got to stand out a little bit because the problem was that it was being compressed by too much bone. So how does that work? Um, so here we see some before and after images. So you can see the bone there and then it's missing there and we can see the uh, cerebellum here and it's got an indent in it and you can see the cerebellum here and it's got less of an indent in it. The problem is that these dogs when we do this uh, surgery I equate it to being a little bit like uh, when you have a pair of shoes and you can't afford a new pair of shoes and you cut the toes off your existing pair of shoes to give your feet a little bit more space. 
ideally you'd um, you you get a new pair of shoes. And what we can't do is just make more space for this brain that um, uh, is needing a great deal more space. Just cutting off the back still isn't giving the back of this brain um, a, a lot of extra space. And we can see that certainly the fourth ventricle is still has some dilation in this dog. And of course, the dog still has a syrinx uh, at this six month post-operative period. A lot of these dogs I follow over many years, and I would say that a lot of them, um, there looks to be a tiny reduction in the syrinx. And certainly um, I've not had one where they have progressed. But as I've said before, if the spinal cord is still expanded, then the syrinx is still filling. So this surgery that I have done has not addressed the filling mechanism. But um, you could argue that the dog is doing reasonably well. Uh, because the pain is adequately controlled on medication, but it's only six months and these are often uh, young dogs. So what does it look like with a titanium mesh? Well, um, here's some surgical examples here. So here's the normal bone. Here's the bone with uh, a mesh now. And you can see the compression of the, sp the spinal uh, cerebellum here and the big syrinx. And we can see relatively similar appearance with the mesh. Um, and uh, and still a syrinx there. So, <clears throat> of course, again, this is one case that I happen to, to take over as, as um, care of. And again, the owner said that 12 months post-operatively, the dog was adequate and had their pain adequately controlled on the medication. And despite this uh, MRI appearance, they felt that the surgery had had a good outcome at that time. Um, it uh, the dog did subsequently get clinical signs, but that is the the the, um, the problem. So basically, a lot of the dogs will have an initial improvement and then ultimately a recurrence of signs of pain. However, some of those dogs may be better controlled on medical management, um, and uh, it may be a couple of years down the line and may have given them uh, some quality of life. We don't tend to see um, a change in the size of the syrinx, nor do we see change in the clinical signs relating to the syrinx. So if the dog had phantom scratching before the surgery, because the syrinx is still present, then we still have phantom scratching after a frame of magnum decompression. And um, actually, very few um, post-operative complications with these surgeries. This is not my case, but I have seen a couple of, of uh, CSF fistulas. So this is um, a dog that had um, a, a frame magnum decompression and a mesh and post-operatively, a few months post-operatively, developed leak of her CSF through her tissue, um, which was on and off. So ultimately, as I said before, what these dogs need is a bigger, a bigger skull for their uh, oversized brain or their normal sized brain and their too small skull, just like this lady here needs a uh, needs a bigger shoe. So going back to the problems that we had initially, did surgery address these problems? Well, pain, maybe. Um, and certainly if the dog is not well controlled on medical management, then surgery may be the only uh, other option apart from euthanasia. Phantom scratching, it's unlikely unless you can do a procedure that can collapse the syrinx. And even then, because of the damage done to the spinal cord, it may be permanent. Emotional health will only be improved if the pain's improved, along with sleeping. Weakness, you need a procedure which will collapse the syrinx. Um, and for me, this will have to be a shunt. So the dogs where weakness is, is the main problem, so French bulldogs, pugs, um, uh, uh, and uh, Griffon Broussel was, these, these breeds are much more likely to get severe cervical thoracic weakness um, and a severe cervical thoracic uh, syrinx that involves the gray matter. They need a procedure which will collapse the syrinx, which which does involve a shunt, which has all those uh, complications. And it's likely some weakness will remain even if you had a successful surgery outcome. So you need to have a follow up with physiotherapy um, and uh, cervical torticollis and scoliosis. No, um, it, it won't improve that. But the weird thing about these is that they generally improve spontaneously over the years without surgery. Um, so. 
um, sometimes in the surgical papers you see that they they feel that this is improved with surgery no actually they they tend to improve by themselves we know we don't fully understand why but because in dogs this is a proprioceptive deficit uh, not a weakness then it is um, uh, I think it is that there is a uh, compensation and they generally have a small scoliosis it's just not as dramatic as the dogs with uh, really um, uh, corkscrewed heads so my conclusions and i'm welcome to have feedback i'm sure there are people there that want to um uh, tell me how wonderful their surgeries ago um uh, have gone i would ask if you're if you're a surgeon if you back it up with mri scans that would be fantastic um is that surgery for chiari pain and syringomyia is definitely an option especially if there is progressive signs or if they're poorly controlled on medical management Shunts are the most likely to result in syrinx collapse, but they can be associated with serious complications such as subdural um, bleed, bleeds. And there was one paper that uh, um, uh, that had really a 25 percent com uh, complication rate uh, with with shunt surgery for hydrocephalus. Frame and magnum decompression with or without an implant does not seem to reverse the filling mechanism for a syrinx, but there may be a clinical improvement in pain for those dogs. So it is, uh, it is a procedure that can be worth considering. The future? Well, uh, at Surrey University, where I work, um, we are, I have a, a very clever PhD student and colleagues that I work with who are um, uh, engineers who are um, doing computer modeling of Syringomyelian dogs and that will allow us to model surgery and perhaps try to get a better outcome rather than trying to do it on dogs um, and of course if we were to breed for larger skulls then that would be excellent thank you very much